Okay, everyone. Can everyone hear me at the back? Okay, or do I need to turn the mic it's up a bit? And that's up a bit. Okay, hopefully that means you can now hear me. So welcome everyone to ESS 21, uh, which is an introduction to the cryosphere. If you don't know what that is, then hopefully you already looked it up, but it is really the frozen part of the Earth, okay? So I have a couple of quick announcements just at the beginning. So you may see that there's cameras in the back, and that's because these lectures are going to be filmed um, and put on YouTube, hopefully later today, um, but usually within 24 hours or so. And that should be great for you guys, because it means if you get horribly sick in the middle of the quarter, uh, you can catch up a bit, um, and you can just go back and watch things again um, if uh, a concept was particularly challenging. Um, but I will send around a link to a little online quiz, which basically means that you have to sign it to say that we're not going to pay you for starring in ES. SS21 this quarter, okay? So hopefully that will be all right for everyone. Um, so uh, just a little bit uh, of an introduction about some of the logistics to begin with. So my contact details are up there. I'm Dr. Ferguson or Professor Ferguson, but you are also very welcome to call me Julie. All, I called all of my undergraduate professors by their first name, so it seems strange for that not to be the case. Uh, my email address is there. I'm also teaching a gigantic 400-person class on oceanography this quarter. So one thing that would really help me out is if you could please put ESS21 in the subject line of any email, and that will make it much, much faster for you to get a response from me. Um, uh, I have lots of office hours listed, and there are lots of office hours because there are lots of you um, and lots of my other class as well. So hopefully I've spread them out so that everyone should be able to go to at least one of them. They're Monday, Wednesday, Friday in my office, and then I have an informal office hour, which basically means I go and sit at the Phoenix Food Court and drink coffee and hopefully chat to whoever turns up about science or life in general, whatever else. Okay? Um, so hopefully you can find me uh, if you need me to. So what have you signed up to learn about? Um, hopefully that is uh, something that you've been thinking about. And really, we're going to cover a lot of different topics. The first couple of weeks are really going to be an introduction to Earth system science, the way that we sort of use science to investigate the world around us, and then also some general information about things like how our climate system works. The real sort of selling point, I think, of this class is one of my favorite classes, is that the cryosphere is changing, and it's changing really fast because of uh, the climate that is changing, and that's sort of something that we're going to talk about. So one of the first things we're going to learn about is really what controls our planetary temperature, what combination of factors from the sun, uh, say how much light is reflecting from the Earth, how much is being absorbed by that, those greenhouse gases, how does that affect our temperature. And then after those sort of couple of weeks of introduction to the climate system and to climate change, we're really going to be moving on to studying about the different the frozen aspects of the Earth. So first of all, we're going to cover snow, and we'll look at things, that, things like the chemistry of uh, ice and why it has this funny six-sided symmetry to it, um, and how, in particular, uh, the, the funny tricks of the ice structure means that it's lighter than its liquid form, and so it floats, whereas most sort of solid versions of things are denser and so sink. So that's a, an interesting uh, aspect of ice. Um, and then we're going to cover things like sea ice. So what happens when the sea gets so cold that it freezes over? And sea ice, especially in the Arctic, is changing incredibly rapidly right now. We're also going to study permafrost. Permafrost is really important. It covers something like 25% of land in the Northern Hemisphere. And no one has the faintest idea what it is. Um, it's basically just frozen soil. And the reason that it's so important for the Earth is actually that frozen soil contains a whole ton of carbon. So if we start thawing that soil out, then that carbon then is going to be released. So we'll study more about that. Um, and then lastly, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about glaciers. And I, and I say that word funny because I'm not from here. Um, but you, I'm sure you'll get used to it. And big ice sheets. And really, those things form from little individual snowflakes. And so we'll study sort of more about the physics of how they move, how we measure them, um, things like that. So it should be really fun. So we'll be studying sort of fundamental aspects of just how the system works and really why you should be interested in that. You say, I'm from Southern California, come on. How many people have, have never seen snow? Quite a few, exactly. Like, why should I care about this? Okay, so you should care about this because it still affects you. 
But those, those uh, processes I talked about, things like the, 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 this white ice reflects a lot of light back to, the, to space. The fact that um, the things like melting and freezing of water releases and, and absorbs heat. All of those are really important for the functioning of our climate system. Um, and they keep us sort of nice and cool. Um, also, if we're going to start changing and melting a lot of our cryosphere, a lot of that ice, then we are going to see things like that middle image at the top there. We are going to see sea level rise. We are already seeing increases in sea level, um, and uh, that will continue in the future. And how much sea level rise will happen really depends on how the cryosphere responds. And, and to a certain extent, we don't really have that good an idea yet of exactly how much it will respond. Um, you can also see that changes in the cryosphere, changes in the amount of snow and ice around, will definitely affect this little guy up in the top right because he is a lovely white colour in the winter and uh, if he is suddenly surrounded by pretty brown stuff then he's pretty easy to pick off for predators. So de we're definitely even seeing in changes in biology already. Um, down here in the bottom left, this is what happens when you build your house on permafrost, on frozen soil, and then some of it thaws out. And this isn't just a problem for houses, but it's a problem for things like rail lines going through Alaska. It's a problem for the big oil pipelines. It's a problem for roads. All of these things, so this infrastructure, um, is really going to be very damaged as this melts. Um, and then lastly, you can see um, a map here showing one of the potential scenarios for uh, the increase in temperature that could occur by the end of this century. And you can see that, yes, we've all heard that the, the global temperatures will rise by 2, 3, 4, 5 degrees Celsius. But that warming isn't evenly distributed. You can see that actually the darker the colour, the purpler the colours, the more uh, heating is going to occur. And really where the biggest change is going to occur is in our Arctic areas. And it's a combination of those different processes, again, like the reflectance, that caused that to happen. But really, those are the areas that are going to see the biggest change. That's a huge, huge, huge change in the next 100 years. And so it really sort of means that we have to start thinking about this. Um, so all of these things uh, are important. But I didn't talk about the top left. Okay? And the top left is really what our water supplies. And that's why here in California, you should care about snow and everything else, because actually quite a lot of our water supply comes from things like snowmelt. If you look globally, maybe two billion people depend on at least part of uh, the cryosphere for their water supply. And so it's really pretty important that we understand how this might change uh, for those people as well. OK, so that's about the class. This is about me. This is me in the cryosphere. Not here, unsurprisingly, but where I grew up. And it still didn't snow very often in England either. Everyone has this funny idea from films. Um, but I'm a lecturer in the ESS department. I think there aren't that many people in this class who have had a class with me before. Um, but I do teach a lot of these big GE classes. So if you like it, hopefully you'll stick around and take another couple. Um, and my research really is in reconstructing what climate was like in the past. I'm a geologist by background, and I sort of moved into the climate field. Um, and why do we care what the climate was like in the past? Well, if we understand how and why it can change in the past, we can get a better sense of how and why it might change in the future, um, and also how much of a role we as humans are having in that change. And it's also one of the really important ways we test our climate models, actually, is by running them for the past to see if they can reproduce things that we know happened. And if, they're, if they just tell us nonsense, then we know that something's wrong. So it's pretty important. So that's what I do. That's about me. We also have a whole bunch of TAs. We have four TAs. Um, and we're very lucky to have all these guys, because they're, I think, all fourth or fifth years now in their PhD. So they're very experienced. They know an awful lot. So I encourage you to make use of them. So I'll get them to come out and stand up and introduce themselves very briefly. <laughs> On mass. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah McKay-Glenn. And my research is kind of like Professor Ferguson's. I am using a stalagmite from Crystal Cave, Sequoia National Park. Maybe some of you have been there. And I am reconstructing atmospheric circulation patterns into California and the United States. Hi, <laughs> I'm Mackenzie, and um, I'm a fourth year graduate student in the Earth System Science Department. 
And I use ice cores to try to reconstruct biomass burning in the past. So I use cores from like Antarctica and Greenland to look at what's going on. So I use the cryosphere every day. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sasha Ritchie. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate, uh, actually in civil engineering. I study hydrology and water resources. I use satellite observations to study groundwater stress. So I try to figure out how much groundwater people are using versus how much is available. And I'm also really interested in trying to connect science to policy and seeing how we can use what we learn in Julie's classes to better inform sustainable management policies. <coughs> Hi, I'm Gargana. I'm in Earth System Science, a graduate student too in my fourth year, and I study air quality. I collect a special type of particles that get emitted from vehicles or from wildfires and try to figure out how much there is because they're actually toxic and there's a lot of it, so it affects everybody. And even though it's a far fetch, it actually affects the cryosphere too because it gets deposited all the way to the Arctic and it makes the snow melt. So in your system science, everything's connected. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so you can see that RTA study a variety of different things, but all of them tie in in some way to sort of things that we'll be talking about in the class. So we're always delighted as ESS people in general to talk about our research or earth system science in general. So I do encourage you to make use of them, so make them work for, for the best of quarter or so. Um, great. Okay. So about you. Okay. So you've heard about us, but I also think it's fair to tell you what sort of the makeup is of the class. So unlike my other class right now, which is mainly all sophomores, Really, the vast majority of you in here are freshmen, actually, which is a little bit different for once. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, and also, the other worry that most people have in these big classes, science GE classes, is, oh my goodness, everyone else here in here is a scientist, and they're all going to be able to do it, and I can't. Um, that's not really the case at all. We have a small army of social scientists. You're probably one of them. Um, and that's always the case. And really, the, the scientists in the room are a minority. We have a handful of uh, biological and physical sciences and maybe some computer and engineering people. But really, the vast majority of people in the, this class aren't sort of science majors. And that may not be your strong point. Um, and so don't worry about it. Um, we really are here to help. And um, we'll take it steady. And uh, you're no different from everyone else around you. OK? Um, because it's a larger number of freshmen in here, I just wanted to remind you that um, on average it's recommended that you spend three or four hours studying by yourself for every hour that you spend in the classroom. And that may sound like a lot, but we have things like online quizzes and discussions um, that will count for some of that. Um, for some of you that are really strong in science, you may not find that you need that much. Um, but for some of you where science isn't your strong point, even if this is a, a GE, and everyone says it's only a GE, which breaks my heart ever so slightly, um, but even though it is only a GE, um, if it's not a subject that you're strong in, then sometimes that does mean that you still have to put the time in. Um, so I do want to warn you about that. Um, but hopefully we can make it exciting, make it interesting, make it something you want to study, and that's sort of the aim of the class. Okay, so... I've given you those graphs, but that's really all I know. And that tells me nothing about who you are, what you're interested in. And um, one of the, the joys of teaching isn't listening to my own voice for an hour every sort of three days. It's actually sort of getting to know you guys. And so I find it really helpful just to, to know a little bit more about the students in my class, what their interests are, um, and everything else. So um, if you have a moment, it's not graded or anything, but if you have a moment, I'd really appreciate it if you could send me a quick email with a little bit of information about you. It makes it a little bit more personal. So these are all in the lecture notes. So I'm going to move on right now, um, but you can find them in the lecture notes on the class website. Okay. So because we have a class website, hopefully a bunch of you have found it already. Um, but on there will be uh, lecture notes. So um, for today, I already uploaded lecture notes by 5 p.m. yesterday, incomplete ones. And then after the lecture, I'll update those um, with things like the eye clicker questions and answers. So you're always able to go to the website and download either a PDF or a PowerPoint version of those. 
Also on there will be things like answers to quizzes, answers to uh, midterms, any extra credit opportunities. It has a full syllabus, it has a schedule. So really it should be the first place you go if you have a question. Because as much as I'd love to be able to respond to individual questions, I have 730 students this quarter, and if I answer sort of an email a day from all of you, it would take me 14 hours, and I would never get anything done. So please do look there first, and if you can't find the answer to your question, then feel free to email me um, and ask about it. Okay? Um, a number of you have uh, emailed me just to double check. There is no textbook for this class, really because there isn't a good GE level textbook for this class. Um, but what we'll do instead is um, we're going to use this uh, United Nations report, which is called the Global Outlook for Ice and Snow. It's available for download from uh, the class website. It's a big file, though, something like 98 megabytes or something. And so you will need a good internet connection to be able to do that. Um, but once you have it on your computer, it should be there. Um, and I'll assign little readings from there um, and also little other readings that pop up um, over the quarter. Okay. So discussion. So this is the syllabus, and I'll skim over this quickly because it's a good idea for you to also download the syllabus and have a look over it. Um, I am going to make four of the, I think, nine remaining discussions um, compulsory, and there's a reason for this. I used to set homeworks for, to give you a chance to practice doing some of the math, to practice using difficult concepts, but the problem was is that people didn't really like doing them, and they did them all together, and there were issues with sort of people copying and things. And so I think what's actually much more helpful is if we do those in discussion when you have access to your TA, perhaps if you're struggling with the math, um, and you can discuss it with people. And I think that's a much more practical way of doing these things. So I, I say a minimum of four, but I would encourage you to go to as many as you can, because it does give you that uh, chance to practice the math, practice those difficult concepts. And I've tried to create little um, activities um, to do each week that uh, relate to the class um, or relate to some sort of important aspect of the Earth that hopefully you will find interesting. Um, and you can find those in the schedule as well. Um, online quizzes, these are really helpful. I think students complain about them, but they find them really helpful because it gives you a sense of how well you're grasping things. It gives you a chance to practice using those concepts. And so there'll be 10 quizzes over the quarter. I'll take the top eight of those scores um, and I'm also nice that I allow you three attempts at each quiz. So I don't tell you which ones you got right or wrong, but you'll get a score out of 10, and that gives you a chance to go back and think about which ones you understood and you think you've got, and which ones you might need to think a bit more about. Okay? And only your best attempt will count. Um, and then the rest of the credit really comes from exams. Okay? There's no escaping those, unfortunately. So we're going to have two midterms um, and one final. And I want to point out to people right now that, very unfortunately, the way the class has fallen this time, it's on Friday. Okay? So if you know that you're going to be gone by Friday, then it's a good idea to find another class, unfortunately, because there won't be any early exams. Okay? But at least you're in the afternoon. My other class is at 8 a.m. in the morning, and I don't function well at that time. Okay? So that's uh, some of that. And I wanted to show you, because we are a science class, there is method behind my madness. OK, so this is what uh, a complicated graph, but it isn't actually. So along the y-axis there, it says percentage record, so basically how much someone remembers from a given lecture. And then along the bottom, it's days from the lecture. And those little circles, the dark circles, represent points where people are tested on it. OK, so you can see that if you go to a lecture and you're not tested on it until 24 days later, you only record about 10% if that, of what you're actually told. Whereas if you're examined on it maybe the next day, then actually you recall maybe 50%. It's still not that high, but it's still a, an improvement on 10%. Okay? And so that's why I have things like the iClicker questions, why we have online quizzes, because it means that you're recalling that information and using it, and that should help you really uh, remember much more of it. Okay? Um, and that's the last part of the syllabus, which is participation. So hopefully everyone has their iClickers. Um, so 4% of the class credit will come from iClickers. You have to use them uh, to respond to at least 75% of the questions uh, in, I say, either 23 of the 26 lectures or, for this quarter only, 21 of the 26 lectures um, and help us out by completing two surveys. And there'll be one in the first week and one in the last week. 
Okay. Um, and so please do register your iClicker if you haven't already. Um, and there are instructions for that on the class website. And why do I use iClickers? Apart from the fact that it really gives me really a valuable sense of how much you understand. If I ask a question and no one gets it right, we can go back and go over it. Um, so I find it really helpful. But the, uh, the other reason that I do it is because this is what your heart rate does in the average lecture. So everyone arrived today and they were really excited and they'd run across campus and they couldn't find the room um, and your heartbeat was maybe at 90 beats per minute. About now, 20 minutes in, everyone's fading fast um, and you're more or less comatose already. Okay? Um, whereas as soon as we ask a question or we get discussing something, everyone wakes up again. And one of the key things about learning is you have to be awake to be able to do it. Okay, and so that's sort of the other purpose of these and the other activities that I'll have in class is really to get you sort of thinking about this stuff. Okay, so I wanted to, I was asked to give you this information about the two surveys that are going to be taught um, or held this, this uh, quarter. Um, and the idea behind this is that we would like to be able to teach uh, DE science better at UCI. The, the aim is to improve what we can offer to students. Um, and so what we're interested to know is what you know about science coming in to, to this class. Okay, so if you want to participate, you can go into Tripoli, e, and I think you should already have had an email about this today with a link to it as well. And the survey is called, What Do You Know About uh, Science? Um, and you can earn participation points by filling in that survey. If you don't want that data from that survey to go on to be used in the research study, you can tick a box and say that you don't want it, and it won't affect the, the participation credit for this class. I also won't see the answers. I'll see a list of who's done it so I can give you your points, but I won't see the, the results or um, who got what right or anything else. Okay? Um, and you have one week to complete the first survey, um, and it's from, open from noon today until next Tuesday, not tomorrow, but a week on Tuesday at 11.45 p.m. Okay? And I'll send a reminder email as well later this week. Okay, and if you have any questions, I'm not actually the one doing this. Um, Dr. Justin Schaefer um, in bio, um, his email is there. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact him. Okay, does anyone have questions for me about that? No? Nope? Good. Okay, so first I click a question of the day. I already asked a little bit about this, but just in general, I'm interested to know what experience of the cryosphere you have. I know I'm teaching this class in a low latitude. So, did you grow up where it was snowy? Have you visited mountain regions or glaciers? Um, you've experienced snow a few times, or you've been ice skating, or you have ice cubes in your drink sometimes. Okay, any last answers, or shall we take a look at the results? Okay, let's take a look and see. So most people have experienced snow a few times. Um, only a few people have really lived somewhere sort of snowy or visited glaciers. And about 10% of you have ice cubes in your drinks sometimes, and that's about it. Which is great, because you'll learn something completely new this time. And hopefully it will inspire you to go and visit somewhere a bit colder than here. OK. So uh, academic honesty and civility. Uh, you guys know this already. I'm not going to uh, beat this to death. But uh, the main thing is eye clickers. It, it drives me crazy and it drives other students crazy. Um, please don't use anyone else's eye clicker for them. That still counts as academic dishonesty because you're earning credit for them. And really, if you think about it, if you do the math, if you miss one lecture, you lose 0.2% of your final grade, okay? Above that 21 or whatever. If you get caught using your eye clicker and someone else's, then both of you lose all of your participation credit and you get reported to the university. So it's just not worth it. Please don't do it. It's, uh, it's trivial amounts of credit if you end up missing a couple of lectures. Um, and uh, we, we like to keep it honest. OK. Um, other expectations? Lectures start at 2 and end at 2.50. Please don't pack up at 2.45. I know it may be tempting, but we lose 10% of our time that way, and we have lots, to, lots of interesting things to cover. Cell phone ringers off. If you're going to use a computer, please do it for class-appropriate activities. There's nothing more distracting, I know you'll agree, than someone sort of watching baseball in front of you or something like that. Um, so please don't do it, um, and the TAs will sort of shut you down if you do try. Um, listen when someone asks a question, please don't talk. 
I know that they're big lecture halls and you think that no one else can tell, but I can and I'll glare at you and yell at you, okay? So please don't do it. Um, and it's just rude to everyone around you who are sort of paying a lot to be here. So please don't. Okay, so that's the class schedule. I'm not going to go over it too much, um, but you can see this on the class website. So we'll spend the first couple of weeks on sort of studying what climate is, how it changes, what's happening today. Then we're going to look at things like snow, permafrost, sea ice, and then glaciers, um, glacial landscapes, and we'll start looking at how we can use ice cores like Mackenzie does to work out how climate has changed. Um, and then look at really how those changes are going to affect people in terms of water supplies, in terms of hazards and, and uh, sea level sea uh, rise in particular. Okay, so that's all online. Um, laptops and note-taking. I'm going to post it, uh, lecture notes, especially because I have lots of diagrams and things, um, because I can go a little bit fast. Um, I'll post them the day before, so you can print them and bring them if you want to take notes on them, and that's not a bad idea. Um, please consider you not using your laptop, because it does make doing those distracting things like checking email ever so easy. Um, the best thing to do is to review your notes within 24 hours. So if there was something you didn't quite understand, go back that night and just sort of uh, look over your notes and see if you can fill something in from the reading or contact me or one of the TAs to help you with that. Um, and the other thing is don't simply read and highlight. I sometimes have, uh, if, if people don't do well in the midterm and want to talk to me, I'm always happy to do that. And they'll come in and I say, well, how did you study? I say, oh, I read everything. And I was like, well, what did you do after that? Oh, I read it again. And what did you do after that? I read it again. And that's all very well. But if you didn't get it the first three times you read it, you're probably not going to get it the next three times. And so other things that uh, are useful to do are things like drawing out diagrams you can pin above your bed so you have to look at them every day or writing out logical sequences of information. Um, and those are good ways, and I'll try and sort of show you how to do that a little bit as we go through the class. Okay, so there is a class Facebook page. A number of people have found this already. It's not compulsory, it's just that there's lots of really cool articles and videos um, and images out there that I want to share that I don't have time to do in lecture. Um, and also it's a good chance for you to ask questions of your classmates or arrange study groups or anything like that. So if you join, if you want, um, I have enough of a life that I'm not going to be stalking you on Facebook. Um, but now is probably a good time when you might want to think, how much information do I want to share with my ESS professor um, and also other employers in general? And so you might want to think about your privacy settings there. Okay. So any questions about that? Or shall we do something more interesting? Yes. The online quizzes aren't timed, so you have as long as you like for three times to do it. So hopefully there's, there's a plenty of chance for you to get good scores. Any others? Yeah. For the Clifford questions, do we have to get them right in order for them to count? Good question. No, it doesn't have to be right. I really like asking you challenging questions that make you think, and I don't like the restrictions that getting it right sort of forces upon you. So I will ask you challenging questions, but don't panic if you don't get them right. OK, another good question. Anything else? Great. Well, let's move on then to Earth System Science. You signed up for an Earth System Science class, and hopefully you know what that is, but just in case there are a few people in the room, Earth System Science is a pretty new approach to studying the Earth. Because before we had geologists, or we had atmospheric sort of dynamics or something like that. Really what Earth System Science does is it takes together in one big department people that study all the different aspects of the Earth. Because really, the Earth is a huge interconnected system. We can't study the atmosphere in isolation without thinking about the role that the ocean plays and the, the role that the land plays in volcanoes and things. And so really what we're saying is we have to study the whole Earth in order to understand the fundamentals of how it operates and how it can change. So that's our definition of, of Earth system science, the science that studies the whole Earth as a system of many interacting parts. And in particular, we focus on the changes in between those parts. Um, and to sort of make it slightly easier for ourselves, we split it down into what we call four spheres. Okay? We have the atmosphere in the center there. We have the biosphere, which is basically all the living things on Earth and also all organic matter that hasn't decayed away yet. We have the, the geosphere, also sometimes called the lithosphere. It's basically what geology deals with. It's the solid rock type part of the Earth, that and sort of soils to a certain extent and sediments. And then we have the hydrosphere. And the hydrosphere encompasses all of Earth's water. 
apart from the water vapour in the atmosphere. That's the only exception there. So really, when we're talking about the hydrosphere, we're talking about the oceans, we're talking about freshwater lakes and streams, we're talking about groundwater, all that water that's in the sediment if you dig deep enough and find it. And also, in particular for our case, we're, we're also including the frozen uh, water on Earth, the cryosphere. There's actually a large part of that of that fresh water on Earth, the stuff that isn't in the oceans, 70% of that fresh water is actually locked away as ice. So it's a really important source of that fresh water, even if it doesn't tend to be where the people are. Okay. So let's look more closely at the cryosphere. So what is it? It is uh, the elements of the Earth system containing water in its frozen state. Um, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but things like snow, lake and river ice, permafrost, that frozen ground, um, sea ice, and then glaciers, ice caps, ice shelves, ice sheets, all of that land ice as well. Okay, so those are the, the different things that we're going to, to go through. Um, and if we put it in a sort of a diagram form, this is a little diagram um, taken from that UN report, I think. Um, and it shows the, the, the glaciers in that sort of darker blue, that snow cover, the pale blue covering, uh, frozen ground. And you can see that that frozen ground, as I said, it covers a lot of the northern hemisphere land up near the pole. And it can actually be down to one kilometer deep. Um, so that's a really, really quite so deep, um, as well as a very extensive spatially. We have that sea ice, which maybe can be two meters, three meters, five meters if it's really old sea ice. Um, and then we have our big ice sheets. And that's where all the, the fresh water is. And because those things are three kilometers thick, and I know that you're not metric people, but that's really thick um, amounts of ice that are sat on Greenland and Antarctica, and those are huge, huge, huge ice sheets. So thinking logically about this, using your common sense, I want you to answer me this. Which of those aspects of the cryosphere, so ice sheets, those big, big three kilometers thick, the sea ice, the permafrost, glaciers or snow, which of those do you think are going to be most sensitive, as in respond most quickly and most dramatically to changes in temperature, so an increase in temperature? Okay. So think about it, consult the person next to you, and uh, answer me which you think will be most sensitive. <coughs> So I think that's more or less everyone. So if you haven't answered, give me your vote and we can take a look at the results. OK, so let's take a look. So most people put E, which is snow. And you would be right. Well done, guys. OK. <laughs> because if you think about it, it's really the thing that appears. So for example, on the East Coast, one of my TAs from either class, and I think someone from this class is stuck on the East Coast somewhere because there's lots of snow. But if we go back in three weeks and when the temperatures rise a bit, there won't be snow anymore. Snow is so thin um, and it sort of comes further south that it's actually much more sensitive. Whereas if we look at our ice sheets, then yes, we're concerned that Greenland and Antarctica will start to melt because of our temperature rising. But we're not going to instantly melt three kilometers of ice in the next 100 years. Okay? Um, it's one of those things that takes a very long time. If you put a huge block of ice outside, you know it takes days sometimes for it to melt away, even at our temperatures. So it's one of those things that, that the thinner it is, then it's much more sensitive. But those big ice sheets, they're big, so even fractional changes can affect us but they're going to respond on much longer time scales. And that's what that little sort of finishing touch to the diagram does. It says that things like river ice, snow, sea ice, and to a certain extent frozen ground when it's really shallow and near the surface, can respond really quickly to changes in temperature. But if we're looking at, say, melting away enormous ice sheets and um, melting that kilometer of frozen ground, then really it takes thousands and thousands of years for those to respond uh, in, in any great amount. Okay doesn't mean that we don't care, but it certainly takes a very long time for them to respond. So we're going to look at a variety of maps in this class, and they're not going to be standard maps. So I thought I'd sort of get you over that point to begin with. OK, 
Does anyone spot North America? It's there, okay? <laughs> so what we're looking at is above my finger there is the North Pole, okay? And then we have Asia and Russia, Africa down here, Australia in the top corner, and then we have North America, South America, and Antarctica. And the reason that we've done this is that if we're interested in snow and ice, we're most interested in the poles. And if we take our normal maps, then they're just sort of stretched out and sort of at the top, and it looks a bit rubbish. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a variety of different sort of, sort of views rather than the standard world map. Um, and so hopefully you'll have a chance to get used to that. Um, but this really shows you the distribution of those different things we've been talking about. We have our big ice sheets, really just Antarctica and Greenland. Those are our two big ice sheets today, even if we have had more in the past. Um, and then if we think about things like snow, snow is sort of most extensive. It can come to quite low latitudes in the winter. It's one of the biggest changes you would see if you were sort of stuck in space for a year on the space station. It's one of the biggest changes you'd see is that snow covering the northern hemisphere in winter and disappearing and melting away in the summer. Um, and so you can see where the permafrost is, you can see where glaciers will be. Um, and the exception to that locations of, of snow and ice around the pole is where do you think? Where else do we get um, snow and ice? Where would you go for the nearest snow and ice here? Yeah, mountains, we go up. So definitely near the poles is where we'll find a lot of our snow and ice. But also if you go up high enough, then you also find snow and ice. And we'll talk more about why that is on Friday. Okay. So, I'm going to do a quick survey now, because I want to know what you know. Um, because there's no point in me teaching you things you already do know. So, my first question, which is a thinking question, what do you think would be most important for building up big glaciers and ice sheets? Do you think it would be cold winter temperatures or cold summer temperatures? So, you can also consult your neighbour again if you want. <coughs> Okay, last couple of seconds. Right, let's take a look and see if people have reached a consensus. So most people have reached a consensus. They think it's colder summer temperatures. And again, you're right. You're doing well today, guys. Okay, absolutely. Because really the main thing we want, it's always going to be cold in the winter. It's always going to be sort of snowy in the winter. If we want that snow to stick around and start building up big ice sheets, we don't want it to melt. And how are we going to stop it melting? We're going to have colder summer temperatures. So great. So first one goes to you guys. So for those people that were in my earlier lecture, don't give the game away. What is the main reason that sea level has risen in the last 100 years? Is it because the seawater has been warming up? Is it the melting of glaciers and ice sheets? Or decreased rainfall on land? Last couple of seconds, the last few votes. Okay, let's take a look. So most people put melting of glaciers and ice. And in fact, you would be wrong, I'm afraid. Not entirely wrong, because they are contributing to sea level rise. But so far, the, the, the melting of our glaciers and ice sheets hasn't contributed that much to our sea level rise. We're definitely concerned about how much more and how much that, that might accelerate in the future. But actually, the main reason that we've seen maybe sort of that much sea level rise in the last 100 years is because the water is warming up. Because as the water warms up, it expands a bit. And if you're expanding four kilometers of seawater, even a little tiny bit of expansion each time is actually going to make a, a manageable or a measurable difference. Okay, It's called thermal expansion. Okay, so it's over 50% of the sea level rise right now is due to that fact, okay? So that's always one that catches you out, so I had to put in one. Okay, so this is a general knowledge and how much you pay attention to the news type question. 
How much less sea ice was there in the summer of 2012 compared to 1970? Is there 10% less, 25% less, 50% less, 95% less? Okay, a few more seconds. You either know it or you don't really, I think, with this one. Let's take a look. So most people said 25% less, but actually C, 50% less, was the right answer there. <laughs> and isn't that astounding? I think that's, I mean, it's, to, to me, it's one of the most worrying changes that we're actually seeing right now. And it's actually happening much more quickly than our climate models suggest that it would. And so it's a really big question right now. Are we still going to have sea ice for the next 30, 40, 50 years? Or actually, is it going to be gone in more like 10, 20 years? I mean, that's obviously a huge change for the top of our planet. We're going to lose that sea ice, and it's obviously going to have a big effect for the biology as well. So we're going to spend a week studying that as well. So well, I'll save the rest for then. Um, and then lastly, here in California, how much of our water supply actually comes from melting snow in the mountains? From our melting snowpack, do you think? Okay, last few seconds. Right. So you got me this time. Absolutely, it's 33%, about a third. Okay. So that should be probably quite surprising because down here at least, I mean, it's, it's unthinkable that we have that much snow, but especially as we go into the Sierra Nevada mountains, there's pretty thick snow up there. And they just did the most recent survey, and hopefully some of you know that last year was one of the driest years on record. In fact, it is the driest year on record for Southern California. I think we only got four inches out of our normal 13. And if you go up there right now, the snowpack is only about a fifth of what it should be at this time of year. And that's a real concern for people like the farmers um, further north, because that means that their water supply might be restricted next year. So these are the things to think about, and we'll keep track of that as uh, the quarter goes on. OK. So why should you care? Why should we care about uh, the ice? I've just sort of given you some very fairly good ex explanations of that. But really because of the feedbacks of climate, we're going to talk much more about feedbacks on Wednesday, and we're going to introduce that sort of terminology. But really the idea that by changing the cryosphere, we're actually going to do things like actually put extra CO2 in the atmosphere from melting permafrost, or reflect less of that incoming solar radiation. So we can exacerbate or we can worsen that climate change uh, by altering the cryosphere. Um, it also might change our ocean circulation um, by the release of fresh water um, into the North Atlantic. Um, we also are going to see changes in ecosystems. We already are seeing changes in ecosystems that depend on snow and ice. And here's our poster child for climate change, our polar bear. But obviously, that's just our top predator in that sort of region. And actually, in order to affect him, we're affecting everything underneath in that food chain as well. So let's, uh, we're going to take a look at some of those changes. Um, if we want to look at it selfishly, um, changing the cryosphere is going to affect water supplies to 2 billion people. It's going to affect sea level, which is one of the biggest problems that your generation is going to face, I think. Um, frequency of natural hazards, it things like um, avalanche risk can change if you're more sort of melting the snow a little bit more sometimes. Um, infrastructure and resource availability around the Arctic. That melting sea ice is big business because there's whole uh, enormous reserves of oil and natural gas in the Arctic Ocean that haven't been recoverable until recently because of that sea ice cover. Um, there's also now an ice shipping routes through the Arctic in the summer if enough ice melts, um, which uh, changes uh, the, the paths of those ships. Um, and also things like tourism and ski industries. We don't necessarily want to see people skiing like this anymore. We want to see some proper snow, and so the, the ski industry actually in the US is one of the most sort of uh, visible 
um, industries campaigning for action on climate change because they see that there's no real way around that for their, their sort of industry. But also we sort of forget sometimes that really it's the way of life for, for traditional communities in the Arctic, I mean in mountain regions. They're used to these very predictable changes um, and they're adapted to those um, and uh, they are seeing some substantial changes which is changing their way of life substantially and it's very sad. Um, and there's a really cool little YouTube video there that I've put for hopefully anyone who's interested in that to watch. Okay. And lastly, you may not necessarily feel it outside today because the weather's always the same here, but if you are anywhere else, more or less, in the US right now, then you know it's pretty damn cold. Um, and you can see that even in Florida, tomorrow morning, I think these are the Tuesday lows, it's going to get way below freezing in northern Florida. And when that happens, interesting things like iguanas falling out of trees and stuff. But also, more seriously, it affects agriculture. Um, and I wanted to show you very quickly, because we have a couple of minutes, just how cold some of those temperatures are. So you can see it's sort of mainly, mainly minus 23, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is sort of colder in Celsius. And I want to show you what happens, what you can do with water when it gets that cold. OK. So if I can find it. So we can ignore the person talking. But if you take boiling water outside at that sort of temperature, this is what you can do with it. <laughs> so you guys don't know cold. That's very cold, OK? So that boiling water, as it breaks into droplets in the air, some of it's evaporating and the rest of it is freezing instantly, OK? <laughs> OK, so as you leave today, be grateful that you're not leaving into that, OK? 